So, welcome everybody um, at the Disruption Network Club number 18. Um, I am Tatiana Bazzichelli, the Artistic Director of the Lab, and uh, here close to me I have Lieke Plucher and Nada Bakker that uh, have been working a lot so, for doing uh, this event since uh, Lieke joined us uh, this year as Community Director and Nada has been working with us already since long as Project Manager and from this year as Community Manager. So I really want to thank them a lot uh, for the great work that they did. And also, uh, I want to introduce the rest of the team. Uh, we have Monty Harmony, that is also our project manager, uh, Jonas Franchi, the designer, and Giacomo Marinsalta, the press manager. And uh, my introduction is going to be very short, short today because I want to leave to them since it's their work. And uh, just I want to say that as you see, this uh, time we change a bit of perspective because the chairs are also sitting differently than our usual setup. And means also that today we are going to change a bit of the perspective of our discussion uh, since this comes from the community uh, perspective. So now I leave the word to both of you and uh, thank you very much for your work and thanks to all the team for arriving to this point today because it's also our last conference of the year. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana, for the introduction. So I will briefly introduce uh, the conference of today, which is the, called Activation, Collective Strategies to Expose Injustice. And the goal of today's event is to gather the community around the Disruption Network Lab to come together to share collective approaches and tools for activating social, political, and cultural change. And first of all, before we uh, go into what we're going to do today, I want to give a thanks to all the funders of our program of this year. So we have been funded this year by the Hauptstadt Kultur Funds, the Capital Culture Fund of Berlin, um, and also the Riva and David Logan Foundation. Um, then we have been supported for, by a grant from the Open Society Initiative for Europe, which is part of the Open Society Foundations, and also by the Checkpoint Charlie Foundation. And we have uh, been working in partnership with the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. And since September this year, also our program is part of the European project called Reimagine Europe. And this is a project which is co-funded by the Creative Europe program of the European Union. Uh, and then specifically the community program, which is called Activation, was funded this year by the Guerrilla Foundation. And we also want to express an extra thanks to the people from State Studio for hosting our meetups in 2019. So um, our program of today from the community program has been worked out in collaboration with Transparency International, which is also our collaboration partner throughout the whole year, which we are really thankful for. And it's been a very fruitful collaboration. So we're very happy to have worked with them and also to welcome them today as part of the program. Um, then we also worked for this program specifically in collaboration with Transparency International Germany, uh, with Hangar, with the Syrian Archive, and with Radical Networks, which were also some of the communities we worked with throughout the year. Uh, and we want to thank our communication partner, Sinwerkstadt, Furderfield, and media partner, Ex Berliner. So after all this list of partners, which is also part of our network and our community, let's dive into the actual topics of today and the community uh, program. So as you can see how the room is set up, we kind of tried to create in this conference the atmosphere that we worked on during the meetup. So this is kind of the big culminating meetup of the year and the closure of our first year of the activation community program. So we wanted to bring everybody together to highlight the ways that communities, networks and initiatives, both from Berlin but also from abroad, are working together on the topics of the conferences that we discussed this year. Uh, which are anti-corruption, fighting algorithmic discrimination, and exposing systems of power and injustice. Um, so as the culmination of this meetup program that we ran throughout the year, we're going to take a look back at these topics uh, in this community conference. Um, so the first conference we did this year, you see here on the infographic, which by the way, you can also pick up at the info stand. So we printed this out as well for you to, to take home. Um, the first conference we did was Dark Havens, which focused on the inner mechanisms of the financial system and especially the crime, corruption and wrongdoing hidden by secretive offshore companies. 
Then the second, second conference was AI Traps, Automating Discrimination, which happened this summer. Uh, there we focused on how AI and algorithms reinforce prejudices and biases of the human society and how we can fight discrimination. Um, and finally, last September, we had the conference Citizens of Evidence, where we looked at the investigative impact of grassroots communities and citizens to expose injustice, corruption and power asymmetries. And so today we're very happy to bring together all the different communities and networks and initiatives that worked with us throughout the year in the community program, which you see here in the big outer circle. And we also invited additional speakers so we can close off this year program altogether. And I'll hand over to Nada to talk a bit more about our meetup program. Thanks, Lika. Uh, and thank you, Jonas, for creating this infographic. Um, okay, so we started the year with, uh, as Lika said, to organize the meetups around the conferences. Okay. Uh, so we have organized so far seven meetups since the beginning of 2019, and um, eight meetups, uh, the meet eighth meetup is coming up on the 6th of December, and we will talk about it more during today. Uh, for each of the conferences, uh, we have organized one meetup before to open a pre-discussion on the conference topic with the community around the Disruption Network Lab and sort of warm up to the conference. Uh, and the meetups after were more to go deeper in one or more of the topics that has been discussed through the conference to create more space for reflections, especially also after the conference program. Uh, the formats varied between uh, discussions, workshops, and presentations. Um, for this year, we have worked with around 12 different communities and initiatives, and also invited some of our uh, long-term partners at the Disruption Network Lab to present and share their strategies on building communities. Uh, as Lika said, today uh, for the activation conference, we have invited again some of these communities whom we have worked with over the past year, to, to share their collective strategies and approaches and also to get in conversation with one another because all over the year they haven't necessarily met, to, met together and also with a bigger setup than our usual meetups. So, um, as also Lika said, we invited a Transparency International, a Transparency Germany, the German chapter of Transparency International, um, as they were also with us at the first meetup, Exposing Secret Connections for Dark Haven, and they will be here shortly after our introduction. Uh, we have also, today we're going to have with us Sara Grant, uh, which together with uh, Dania Vazilev, uh, they have from Radical Network, uh, they organized a workshop on using open source tools to set up a secure self-hosted file distribution systems. Um, and finally, with Hedi Al Khatib from the Syrian Archive, which will also be here today in conversation with uh, Yasmina Mutwelli uh, from the Syrian Archive, on which we organized the workshop Searching the Earth using geolocation technique as a verification methodology, uh, where we looked at some of the tools and sources used by the Syrian Archive to collect and verify the video material found on YouTube and other platform on human, vi uh, human rights violation in the Syrian conflict. And yeah. So yeah, what we hope to reach with today in today's uh, first community uh, conference, is we hope that we can bring you some inspiration through the sharing of these collective strategies and tools for exposing injustice. And we hope that we are able to create an atmosphere where you can also meet others that are working on such alternative ways of intervening in society. And finally, of course, we hope that you can discover also ways to connect with our wider network and our activities in the future. And a uh, link to that, I also would like to point out, you probably found it already before you set that little forms on all of the chairs. So we would be also very happy to hear from you what you think would be interesting topics or general feedback or things you want to know from us. Like, please write them down and you can leave them there at the info desk. There's a little box where you can put them in. And of course, you can also come talk to us during this event. Um, so for the program of today, we opened this morning already with two different workshops. So Joanna Moll did a workshop called The Interface Deconstructed, uh, which looked at deconstructing the internet, which is a very complex physical structure uh, composed by a massive number of actors that have a direct and deep impact in every aspect of our daily lives, which we will also see later on in the film screening today. And Joanna will be giving an artist talk later this afternoon. And then there was another workshop this morning here in Studio One by Jasmina Medvali, and it was called How to Perform an Archive. 
and she went into the topic of storytelling and the participants collectively looked into different modes of seeing and participating in a political event. So uh, Jasmina will join in the conversation on archives of evidence later this afternoon. Um, so on the program today there are different open conversations on each of our conference topics. There will be the artist talk by Joanna Moll, a short film screening of Pink Whistleblower on the Cambridge Analytica Whistleblower, and hopefully, of course, lots of time to also talk with each other and meet up and have a drink in the break at our very small bar, which is there at the front. So, yeah, we look forward to uh, sharing this afternoon and this conference with you. And um, yeah, thank you, Nada, for sharing the introduction. <laughs> And then I would say let's dive into the first uh, program part, which is the first conversation. And this conversation is called Untangling Complexity, Working on Anti-Corruption from the International to the Local Level. And this is also reflecting back on our first conference topic of Dark Havens, which dealt with the offshore financial system and its secret mechanisms. And we're very happy to welcome two of the speakers to this panel which also represent two important collaboration partners. So there's Max Haywood from Transparency International. So uh, Max was uh, our part of Transparency International, our collaboration partner of this year. And he currently leads the policy team at the International Secretariat of Transparency International, uh, which is a global coalition working on anti-corruption. Uh, and his main area of focus is anti-money laundering policy. And he previously worked as an economic analyst in Argentina. And he holds degrees in economics and public policy. And then second speaker on our panel is Stefan Ome from Transparency International Deutschland. Um, he's involved... <laughs> and he's involved with them uh, as an expert on finances. And he currently focuses on also on anti-money laundering and illicit financial flows. Uh, he's a lawyer by profession, and he has working experience in international development cooperation in Turkey, South Africa, and Jordan, where he led the UN negotiations on the financing of sustainable development on behalf of the German government. So we look forward to hearing more from them in this conversation. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lieke and Nada and Tatiana and team. It's great to be back with you guys in, the, in this room. So we were at the Dark Havens event in uh, April, I think. So it's, it's really good to be back here. And thank you so much for, for joining us for this uh, conversation this, this afternoon. So um, as Lika was saying, uh, we work for Transparency International, which is set up as a network. It was founded in Berlin in 1993. And uh, we now have what we call chapters. So we have partners in 100 countries. And we have an international office, which is in Moabit. And uh, Berlin is quite special, not only because we were founded here, but because we have two offices, which is also TI Germany. So we have, you know, in every country we have sort of one office. In Berlin we have two, so we have the international office and close to Alexanderplatz, we have uh, TI Germany. And um, what I wanted to, to, to ask, uh, sort of structure these first like minutes around was to ask us to think of, of three lines. And the first line is, from zero to 10, let's imagine there's a line in this room, and it's a person's ambition to make money in life. So starting with, say, zero, you have a monk who's happy to live you know, in a cave with nothing, and at 10, you have someone whose primary ambition in life is to make as much money in as short a time as possible. Someone who feels that they need and they deserve to live on a mega yacht, to own several yachts and a super jet, you know, so that's, number 10, right? So maybe there's someone like that in this room today who already has that as a goal in life or maybe has already achieved it, I don't know, and is undercover, sort of looking how the normal people live. Um, the second line, so that's line one, you know, ambition to, to earn money. The second line is, uh, let's call it personal honesty. So let's say, you know, you walk out of this uh, event today and you find a wallet on the street. Different people will react differently to that event. You know, so some people will pick it up and see if they can find some ID or telephone number inside to call the person and say, hey, I found your wallet. Some people will take it to the uh, you know, closest police station. Some people will just leave it there. Other people will take out the cash and throw it on the ground again. Other people will take, it, take out the cash and throw it in the trash. And yet other people will take out the cash, check if there's a credit card, go to an internet cafe, log, online, log in online anonymously, buy as much as they can, 
potentially steal the person's identity to set up a fake bank account in the Cayman Islands and scam as many people as they can. So there's a whole variety of you know, ways to react to this, again, from 0 to 10, right? Um, and the third line, so we have ambition to make money, personal honesty, and the third line, which is uh, probably the, the critical one for, for us in our work, is what we call, could call uh, the level of transparency in government and business in a given country or context. And there's sort of this myth, you know, for, for many years now that, you know, the private sector is good. You know, the private sector is where you, you, you know, make money and it's like entrepreneurs and that kind of thing. And the public sector is this, you know, old um, sort of, you know, sclerotic thing that just leeches off the, the work of the private sector. And increasingly, you know, economists are, are showing that that is simply not true that you know, many of the big fortunes in the world are actually made from dealing with governments or from getting government licenses. So for example, if you look at the sources of wealth of the, the, the richest 100 people in the world, the majority of them come from oil, gas, and telecoms. And this is not that you know, they were necessarily great businessmen. These are people who somehow managed to get a license to take oil out of the ground. So they found a government that was willing to give them the, the license, for example, for 30 years to say, okay, all the oil you find in this field for the next 30 years is yours. You just have to pay us a 3% fee. You know? that, if you get that kind of deal, you will get very rich very fast. And you don't necessarily have to be a great businessman to get that deal. Similarly with telecoms, the, for example, the, the richest man in, in, in Mexico and one of the richest people in the world is called Carlos Slim. And he was a businessman, he was doing quite okay. But his big break came in the 90s when he got the contract for all of the cell phone coverage and the towers for cell phones in Mexico at ridiculously overpriced. You know, Mexico at the time had one of the most expensive cell phone rates in the world, you know, to make a call or to send an SMS. Every time a citizen in Mexico sent an SMS or called someone, that was sent going into his pocket. He became a billionaire very fast. Again, you know, this is maybe, you know, you could say this is a visionary sort of person, but it's also, you know, not exactly, um, you know, someone who really worked really hard after that point. After that point, he just had to sort of relax and see the cash come in. And I say this because what, when we talk about, um, you know, corruption, this is one of the biggest challenges that we see. When these three lines come together, when you find someone who has, for some reason, an insane desire to make money, for example, um, there was a profile last week of a, a, a guy called Gerald Cotton, who started working with cryptocurrencies online at the age of 15. And by the age of 25, owns $250 million. Say that you have someone like that, you know? So someone who's really, really ambitious to make money, um, has very low levels of personal honesty, and is working in a context where um, there's very little transparency about how these types of contracts are handed out. That is where you're going to find a massive corruption problem. And the, uh, one, perhaps the, the, the one big example in, in recent years is a guy called Joe Lowe from Malaysia, who was the producer of a movie called The Wolf of Wall Street with Leonardo, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, so the, directed by Martin Scorsese. He was 27 years old at the time. And he invested $100 million to make this movie. Where did a 27-year-old guy from Malaysia get the money to invest $100 million in a movie with, with Leonardo DiCaprio? He was friends with the son of the Prime Minister of Malaysia. And he advised the Prime Minister of Malaysia to set up a fund to invest public money around the world to, in theory, multiply those funds for the people of Malaysia. But in practice, what he was doing was he was setting up different uh, fake companies around the world, and the money, instead of going into investments, was going into his own pocket and those of, obviously, also allegedly, uh, the prime minister and other people in his network. And so this is why we are called Transparency International, because corruption itself is very difficult to detect. It's very difficult to detect these kind of deals where people are setting up these complex, you know, the title of this session is complexity. So it's not just about, you know, the information being available. It's also about being able to join the dots. If you're facing a network of people, for example, who have decided that this is what they want to do in life, they've decided they want to steal as much government money or public money as possible and take it home and convert it into super yachts, very often what you find when you look at these schemes, it's as if the, the information is there, but it's dispersed, and it's made really complicated on purpose. So 
for example, imagine if I told you that in this building there were five pieces of paper, and if you put those five pieces of paper together, it's the code to a bank account with, I don't know, $10 million. Go find those five pieces of paper. It's an imaginary example. You know, I am being transparent. The information exists. I'm telling you where it is. It's in this building. But you could spend many, many, many days trying to find that information and putting it together. And that's what it looks like when you're trying to investigate a, a, a case of corruption. You, you talk to, for example, uh, financial crime police and people who are trying to follow the trail of these big cases. And they spend months and months of months trying to do that. They're trying to put information together from the Cayman Islands. Um, in, in April, we were talking about the Panama Papers. So we spent a, a lot of time talking about that, about how these complicated structures are used to almost like hide in plain sight. So what our partners in countries spend a lot of time doing is campaigning and asking governments and businesses to make information available in a way that makes it easy to combine it. Basically, to make the, when we talk about, for example, making data open, it's not just about finding that information. It's about managing to combine it with other data sources and be able to say, for example, you know, okay, who owns this piece of real estate in Berlin? And then combine that data set with, for example, some information from the British Virgin Islands, you know, or from Russia, etc. That's when you start to discover interesting things and who's actually owning what and where they got the money from. So almost all of the big corruption cases that have been uncovered in recent years, including this one from Malaysia we were just talking about and many, many others, have come from that joining the dots of information becoming available and going through, you know, in, in the movies they always make it look really like a a quick, uh, what do you call it, like a quick sequence with some music where the guy's like looking through some papers and looking at his computer screen, but it's, it's really sort of months and months and months of that and drawing the dots, and eventually you find the story that, that allows you to uncover that, that corruption. And, um, and the last thing I, I, think, I think there to say is that, um, you know, this is why we keep uh, telling people that it's important to ask for these things. For example, in Berlin now, I think maybe Stefan mentioned it, there is a law that's going, um, it's, an, it's a draft law to get the city of Berlin to be more proactive in the information it publishes, you know? And this matters not just for the people of Berlin. It may matter for the people um, in Latin America. I grew up in Argentina. Maybe once that information is transparent, you will find a politician from Argentina who is owning property in Berlin. And no one was able to join that dots. The police in Argentina could not find where he had his money stashed. It's just an example, right? But that kind of thing. So thinking about, you know, uh, complexity in local and global, all of these things are connected. So the more people at the local level are fighting to have their data and the data about what their government is spending on and who owns what, um, the more it will be, the, the more difficult it will be for these people with crazy ambitions and very low levels of personal honesty to actually get away with what they're planning to do. Zero minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Max. After this very lively introduction, I think it's very difficult to uh, bring up now the methods and the, I would say, the challenges we are facing on the local level. I'm coming from Transparency International Germany, and believe me, nothing is local. Nothing in this world is just on the German level. Everything we are doing is interconnected exactly to the topics, as you're mentioning, in, on the international scale. Just take this week. What's happened today? Daphne Galizia, Malta. The Prime Minister hopefully will resign. Because what? Because a journalist was killed because of investigations against corruption. We had a meeting here in June this year where we spoke to the son of Daphne. So this is a European issue. All of a sudden we see already European Administration Commission not believing that Malta will solve these problems by themselves. They sent their own investigation commission into Malta to investigate police and of course the government's actions there. So this is one example. What's the next example? We have the, this year, this week, we had in Brussels the country by country reporting issue. What does that mean? Big multinational companies beyond 750 million uh, EU euros per year uh, must publish 
where and how they pay taxes. Imagine a big company having subsidiaries in various countries and profit shifting always to the country where the lowest tax rates apply. And of course, transfer pricing means that they of course sell products within their own substructures to those places where they pay most so that they have losses, which in the end deduct them from the tax which they would have to pay on their profit. Would you know about the origins of Transparency International here in Germany back in the 90s, what was possible at that time? If you were bribing a country, a, another government, if you were bribing someone to get benefits out of transactions, you could deduct this from your own tax account. You could deduct this and not pay for it. No, it was even regarded as a loss, so that you have had a profit, a double profit of that one. And we had it, one member of our board at that time indicated officially that he bribed a foreign official and said, I paid this and this amount, and he deducted this from his tax account, and this was accepted by the financial authorities in Germany. Please, just that you know where we stand. We stand in a country, also in Germany, where still today we have double standards in many ways. Double standards everyone meets every day, and this is exactly the driving force for us also, why we want to do something from the local level. And I say again, local is nothing, because if you look at the next example, ComEx, who's heard about that one? ComEx, that means that you buy shares, you get dividends on those ones, you pay taxes, and in the meanwhile, you sell these shares together with the dividends and several other owners, you won't believe it, it's, it's possible to own shares in several times, they will deduct those tax payments which were once made several times with the financial authorities. It seems that more than 11 billion euros were just taken away from the European and particularly German tax authority th through this scheme and it took more than 10 years to disclose this and big companies like, please look into the news, just type in Freshfield and see what you get. Freshfield you get one of the biggest law companies, law and tax advising companies in the world, but this time it's in Germany, annual turnover 450 million euros and they have only 300 people working with them, but every one of them is regarded to pay to make a return of 1.5 million roughly, I say now, in the year, so that when they have half a million salary, you can see what the rest is, profits. And what is made out of these profits, how are they doing? They they are ingenious, they are creative in finding many ways and means to, of course, let's say, circumvene very restrictive tax obligations and uh, regulations as they are. Not saying that these people are crooks, not at all. They're exclusive, they're legal acting, legally acting, and they provide documentation and expertise to others, like banks, for example, telling them that their actions, and we had this in the ComEx scandal, were legal. Everyone believed it. And so you had all of a sudden a situation where us, the German taxpayers in this case, were more or less cheated by those who took taxes away. And the head of the tax department of that fresh food company has been jailed this week. So this is just this week what I'm talking about. What happened last week or the week before? A new law on anti-money laundering passing the German parliament, honestly saying it could have been worse. It's quite a good step in the right direction, we feel, from Transparency International, because it shows us that in future we will have open public access to, for example, the beneficial ownership registers, which means that we should better know who owns what, who is the proprietor of any undertaking, which in the end could also benefit from some hidden or whatever kind of front actions, which one simply wants to investigate, disclose, and see how it's working. In particular in Berlin, very important, it is that we also have movement in regards to the real estate sector, that in future also foreign companies who are not on the market here but buy property must be registered and must disclose the beneficial owners. I put a very simple thing. But those are the things we are working on. This is all, by the way, being steered from the European level by a certain money director which came from there. So again, nothing is local when we talk with each other. We see that we have a lot of issues which also on the G20 and below the G7 and the OECD level are keeping us busy as 
Transparency International here in Germany. How are we working? Germany, we have about 1,200 members, different working groups. I'm heading the working group on finance, and we have an annual turnover of roughly about 500,000 euros. It's not much. This is just membership fees, which we're using. We have a small secretariat of six people permanently employed. We have some interns, one is sitting there, hello, and uh, we are actively very much acting with the International Secretariat and also, and this I must say is one of the methods which we try to pursue, we want to be seriously, we want to be, let's say, honestly taken account of and respected. We are not shrill. We are not radical in our approaches. We, whatever we say, we try to prove, we try to make it as convincing as possible so that we also have counterparts working with us or at least attending our invitations and our meetings, like for example Olaf Scholz, who is coming on the 9th of December to a big meeting which we're having exactly on the Cum-Ex scandal issue, which will take place in the he, local representation of Niedersachsen in the Ministergärten, Again, Monday, December 9, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you're heavily, cordially invited to attend that meeting with Olaf Scholz. Not that we are not going to promote his ideas, but we want to speak with him. Why, for example, he promoted in this competition over the head of the SPD that he would work on the country-by-country -country reporting positively. Germany this week in Brussels withheld its voice, it vetoed. It vetoed something where we would have pos had possibilities to disclose the profit shifting, the transfer pricing amongst subsidiaries of big companies, as I just mentioned that one. Why did he not act in favor? He might say, of course, the CDU didn't want it because there were other forces in the play. This might be true, but I mean, it's all a question of bargaining. It's also a question of public access to information, and this is something which we regard extremely important. Last thing, it was mentioned I, came from, I come from Development Corporation where I work 30 years in, and honestly saying one of the big issues we've always seen is development aid is one issue, but the other issue is how much money is coming as illicit flows from development countries and other countries into Germany. We still think that the sums coming in are more than the money going out for development aid. Rough figures in general. We estimate, and this is official figure of German Minister of Finance, 100 billion euros every year are money laundered in Germany. This is not figures coming from the developing countries. This is an overall figure. But we can imagine that certain percentages of those funds come from bribery, from whatever kind of corruption, also into the country. We want to see these figures to be disclosed and see that these assets, as they are, get repatriated, get into the developing countries back, see that they're used for the benefits there, and the sum of funds which have yet been repatriated is zero. So just to mention that figure, and I would like to conclude and invite you all to work with us together. Thanks. All right, thank you both for your contribution. And I think from both of your talks, it's pretty obvious it's a complex issue and we definitely need collaboration to work on it. Um, I was wondering if you could share a bit, maybe from the international perspective, but also from the German perspective, um, since when we talked before, you mentioned also that it's important to look at best practices from other countries to see what could help in Germany to start solving uh, the issue. Um, so could you talk a bit about what work uh, either you're currently working on or what big step forward you see coming maybe next year or some practice that is happening in another country which you think could maybe be adopted in Germany to help the situation? Um. So basically, the, 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 the strange thing about this corruption business is that countries know by now what they need to do. You know, so 25 years ago, 26 years ago, when our organization was funded and also other organizations, it was, there was a lot of discussion about corruption, you know, is, is so uh, intrinsically difficult and complex that no one will ever understand it, etc. Since then, there's been a lot of advances in understanding what needs to happen. You know, if you make, as uh, Stefan was saying, you know, uh, information available about who owns what, who owns real estate, um, you know, and make it uh, possible for people to make those connections, you make corruption much more difficult. And countries know this, and we know this because they have signed 
international agreements. So they have signed, for example, at the United Nations, 176 countries, I believe is the latest number, they've all signed up to a long checklist of things that they all agree they have to meet. If you look at the G20 countries, they also have their own checklist where they all on paper, the countries committed, yes, we will have these laws in place and transparency and all that kind of thing. The challenge is that they are not being implemented in the countries. So, you know, so they, they go and they commit and there's a signing and they take the photo, etc. They fly home and 10 years later, 15 years later, they are still not actually implementing those things fully, right? And to give you just one example, so... Um, we spoke in the conference in April, was it, about whistleblowing. We had a really great session where we had actual whistleblowers who, uh, one of them came from an actual bank, so she was the one who blew the whistle on her own colleagues. It was really, really difficult. And one of the, of the key things there is that countries need to have better protection for whistleblowers. You know, if you are actually, you know, speaking out about wrongdoing that's happening by your bosses or by your colleagues, etc., you should have some protection so you're not fired, you know, and, and, and just in general, so, so to make your life a little bit easier. And uh, just two, three months ago, the European Union agreed that they will have uh, what they call a directive. So it's basically saying that all EU member states, all EU governments should have this type of legislation to uh, protect whistleblowers in every country. The trick though is that countries now have two years to take that paper and make it international legislation. And that is where I think that all of our partners, and especially perhaps in Germany, need to be following that very closely because what governments do if they don't want to um, take this seriously is just do the bare minimum. You know, so they take that checklist and they tick, you know, we need a four out of 10, almost like a test. It's like, okay, we're gonna do, we need a four out of 10 to pass, we're gonna do four points instead of a full list. So a lot of the work that we do, and it would be great, you know, to also get more people uh, keep, uh, keeping an eye on, on those things would be to, to just keep putting pressure on governments to implement the things that they already said they would do. You know, this is not that they have to learn or figure out what, what measures need to be taken, right? Yeah, to just briefly mention one issue, and this is um, open and public means reputation. Reputation is crucial for anyone, of course, but in particular also for governments. Blame, naming and shaming, for example, who is doing what in a comparison with other countries is a very effective instrument. We have some very good studies done by uh, Max and his colleagues on comparing Germany, for example, with certain criteria with other countries on the issue of open data. Open data means you can read data with a machine. Machine means, of course, now uh, with, with, uh, inter uh, with uh, artificial intelligence in the end. This means that you can read and scrutinize registers not only on the question who owns a company, but for example, if you have the beneficial owner, the name of the person, that you then also know which other companies do these people own. Very important to see networks, structures, and so forth. This is something which, as a good example, UK has, for example. They have a certain register which has got people with significant control, which is openly accessible and open data. Not all the data are perfect, valid, there are still some different efficiencies, but this is something we are aiming at. We want to see that things are open, public, like country by country reporting, which is mentioned. It happens already, but it's secret. It's secret for the financial authorities only. And as we see from the Comex scandal and others, sometimes it doesn't work only if you make it, it does work only if you make it public, because authorities are too much intertwined, intermingled, connected with the, I would say, private entities they should um, not only observe but also guard or, uh, or control or whatever you would say. And this is something, this working together in exclusive circles, collusion so to say, is a tendency. Human may be, but it's something which transparency always wants to break up again. All right, then I would say let's open it up to our wider circle. So um, if somebody has a question to either of our speakers. We will have some microphones. Thank you so much. Uh, I think the main question is how to make citizens working for what you say. And we in the Hope is Back network, we are few but here is the idea. Make people to be equal shareholders over companies 
that are in the matter of what you want to change. And I will give example, and then you can make it better. <coughs> so, we live in extension period of time that central banks make fake money to increase gap between people and pollute airs until extension. That's how we see it. <coughs> and we can improve it by the following way. We will restrict central banks to loan money not only to exclusive players as they do, but to companies having equal shareholders, equal shareholders companies of the citizens of that issue they want to uh, increase attention of, let's say, green company and uh, and green company energy as con equal shareholder thing. But you can do other focuses. You can have a social uh, interest focuses, transparency, investigation, etc. It's the same kind. <laughs> and so the point is the moment people are equal shareholders of let's say the green energy in this example, they will ask the question, they will have interest, you will move the public, of, the public attention toward your interest. So that's the point. Yeah, I think um, that is one of the challenges in this field of work, you know, making it relevant to citizens, as you say. And I think there's a very concrete example from this week, which is, um, so in Brussels, there was this discussion with the EU governments about this country by country reporting, which is about getting multinationals that operate across borders to publish very simple data, how many staff they have in each country, um, how much money they make, and how much taxes they pay, basically. Um, and multinationals continue to refuse to do this. Just to tell you how many people they employ in Germany, how much tax they pay, they are refusing to do that. Because if you did that, for example, with, I don't know, Amazon, you would see that they have a lot of staff in Germany and almost no staff in Luxembourg, which is a tax haven, but almost all the profits are made in Luxembourg, surprisingly enough, and they pay no tax there, you know? So just an example. Outside of the, of the building, I think this was on Thursday in Brussels, there were maybe 20 people demonstrating, and half of them were from NGOs, two of them were our colleagues, you know, and, and it's, it's this kind of thing, where, and it's also on us, I have to admit that we know we have not been good enough at explaining and getting people to involve, so any ideas from this type of community and how we could be doing better at that, but in general, because the flip side is, um, you know, we spend a bit of a time, you know, every year we get the chance I don't know, six, seven times a year to actually meet a decision maker. Like, you know, um, Stefan was saying they're going to get this minister, Olaf Schulz, to come. So we have these opportunities to interact with relatively high-level people. And I think what's important to realize is that they do care about what citizens say. If, they are get, if it's specific, you know what I mean? If you're talking to a minister and that minister is getting letters and emails in their office and they have someone standing outside their office asking for something very specific that they have the power to do, then that really does influence them. And we've seen that many, many times. You know, it's only when, for example, there's a scandal in the media and then people are phoning into like, or writing in, in comments and there's lots of social media action or something. They have people in their offices monitoring these things. So citizens, not to be too, like, it's, it's not about sort of the change the world thing. It's about if, you wanted to, if you've got enough people and it doesn't have to be a massive number who are really campaigning on something very specific, and they are targeting the right people in a government, they really can drive change and open doors for other people like us and many others who are trying to also do similar things, right? Maybe, Stefan, if you would like to add also, because we briefly talked about this before, about how you work with different groups also in Berlin and in Germany when you try to influence policymakers and how you interact like, with the wider network of groups active in this field. Yeah, thanks very much for that. Um, of course, we are not alone. Transparency International is a small NGO, honestly saying, in Germany at least. It's a worldwide movement that's good, and of course, we have the possibility to share best practices, for example. In Germany, we work very closely together with several other NGOs, which is, for example, Netzwerk Steuergerechtigkeit. We have then uh, NGOs in uh, various other fields, which are, for example, like lobby control and so forth, working in this regards. We try to see that we have that diverse 
commerce movement, bringing in comparable and, of course, also then uh, advantageous um, uh, inputs. And but on the other side, I would also like to say that Transparency tried to some, some be a bit like a pilot to see whom to best address what, for what issue, because we get lost in complexity. We get lost in complexity of all the various actors on the government side, national, international, and the various interest groups. For example, if we want to see that we do better in anti-money laundering, that we would do better on country-by-country -country reporting, one of the major, let's say, stakeholders from the other side is the German Foundation of Deutsche Familienunternehmen. What does that mean? German Association of Family-Owned Businesses. Family-owned sounds like bakery around the corner or the slaughterhouse or maybe whatever. No, it's big companies which have the billions of annual turnovers which want not to disclose their own businesses and the way how they make it. I'm not saying they, anything is illegal. To make it clear, because we're streaming here and so forth, I don't not want to be accused, uh, accused afterwards to accusing them of something. But no, no, they are fully legitimate in their work and what they are doing. They are just pursuing interests. Interests of not disclosing information where and how they cooperate. And when they disclose something, it's mostly with the message to us, we cannot say much because we feel if we disclose everything we get hijacked or someone will blackmail us because of the fortunes we have. It's a very ambivalent argument, I would say, just to mention that. Do we have more questions from the audience? Anecdotes. Anecdotes. So from what I gather is that uh, politicians know about what they can do. Uh, they know that you know <laughs> what is to be done mm -hmm. and what is happening. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you don't have enough power to convince them or to pressure them into taking real measures uh, ends up uh, in uh, the conclusion that it needs some kind of powerful communication to the citizens to convince that they need to focus on certain issues and put pressure on certain politicians to move on with uh, clear decisions and changes. So the, the conclusion that I get is the communication part, mm -hmm. the power of communication to the citizen to focus the pressure on certain issues and certain yep. politicians. Yeah, no, I think that, that that's absolutely right. And because the experience is that, you know, politicians have many different, they have other groups also pushing them to do things. And one of the biggest ones is, for example, business, who keep on saying, you know, if you do this more transparency thing, it will affect jobs, for example. That's the classic. So they've got all these competing priorities about, you know, they have to negotiate a trade deal with China. I don't know. They have to create more jobs. They have to plant more trees. And there's, a, there's always... so. It, it's almost like the experience is putting these really critical issues to citizens and pushing it up the agenda. That's almost like, so I completely agree. It's about the communication and also about probably linking the issues. You know, so for example, um, climate change. Why isn't there more progress against climate change? Because of the counter lobbying by big business and oil and gas, you know, who have known for years about what needs to be done, but have been consistently being, first of all, you know, not taking action themselves, but also effectively counter lobbying to delay the progress that needs to be made. So I think that, yes, it's about that communication and also just linking it to sort of more, uh, perhaps less abstract issues, you know, and, and getting better at that and, and joining the, the dots that way. You already know, as an organization that focuses on these issues, yes. uh, about certain connections mm -hmm. and how they affect uh, yes. and influence uh, these yes. issues. Correct. And it's only a matter of focusing the attention of the public on those. So I think it's the, the communication part that has to be really, really Whatever. good in order to put pressure in the yep. right point. Yeah, maybe one word more, um, maybe try then 
sometimes to be like intermediaries in terms of translating the processes as complex as they are. And unfortunately, as a diverse as the world is, I cannot help it. Uh, we, we must see that our democratic structures are sort of strengthened and transparency, making it open, making it clear who pursues what interests, because everyone has a role in that game, so to say. This is something which we feel is extremely important because then you can better identify also why and how people are looking at issues. One anecdote I would briefly like to mention, this is when we had two weeks ago the anti-money laundering law in German parliament, it was clear that the the great coalition would um, endorse it and the others would withhold because they liked it in a way, that new law, but still it was something for many reasons that could not approve it because the Greens said that I had to say there's still some issues which of course not perfect. But the most interesting thing was that the voting process was delayed in German parliament, severely delayed, because what? Because the American government intervened within the parliamentary process on that day, the German, no, the American embassy intervened directly at the chancellery and wanted to change one part of the law, which was Apple Pay, because in that law it was permitted that the NFC interface, which you have if you have an iPhone, is not only open for Apple Pay, but for anyone who's got a certain turnover in terms of money payments which you can make with a contactless uh, uh, smartphone when you go to a cash and so forth. And Apple wanted to see that they reserve the exclusive right of using the iPhone only for Apple Pay. So the American embassy intervened at the chancellery and there was discussion then in the German parliament amongst the parties who rules the country, so to say. And there was, of course, a very strong solidarity moment in that moment against this kind of intervention. And the most interesting thing is when you read the protocol of the parliamentary session, you can also see it in Mediathek of German Parliament, you have very, very extreme situation where once, at least, all the parliamentarians together lobbied against lobby from the outside. We have time for some more questions. This may, may be terribly naive, but how is that even possible? Like, that, that, how is it even legitimate that um, the American embassy could come in and interfere with German lawmaking? I don't quite understand how that interference worked out. Well, anyone can, of course, contact anyone, and you can talk to people and see that you have maybe something serious to say, and uh, that, of course, you will find that certain... I mean, it is... We are an open society. Anyone can talk to anyone. This is good. I believe in this kind of mode. I don't believe that the parliamentary process should be disturbed from the outside. This is for sure. That's why I'm mentioning that anecdote. Why they then delayed it for two or three hours, I think they, they wanted simply to certify that there was nothing hidden which maybe has been overseen or so. It could be also technical reasons. But anyhow, there was that intervention. If you look in the newspaper and so forth, you read about it. And just mentioning that as an anecdote to see how sincere people follow up these processes wherever they are. And maybe the other thing there is that governments do that kind of thing all the time. You know, governments lobby on behalf of their businesses all the time to open up markets, and it's, it's, it's somehow widely accepted, you know, and in some cases it may even be good, but maybe, you know. I think there was another question in the back. Um, hi, uh, thank you for the uh, speech. Um, I'm just curious, uh, referring back to the point of open data, if you can share if um, your perspective on applying pressure from the investor or shareholder side, or if you guys have any experience at all with them. Um, yes, that is an excellent pressure point. So um, some of the biggest progress we've seen with uh, company data has been through pressures from big investors, uh, especially in the US. So because, um, you know, many fraud cases come when information is hidden, you know, so investors have lost their money. You know, so it, it, it's strange, but in some cases, some types of, of big investment funds have actually been in favor of transparency because they've seen that there's a business uh, sort of reason for it. Um, so yes, that is a very useful pressure point. Uh, the challenge there is to try and align, is to try and show them or convince them or, or, or align the interests to say, okay, this is also in your own interest. It's very hard to convince an investment fund at the moment, most of them, to do something just because it's good for the world. You know, I mean, you were still at that point where you have to convince them this is not just good for the world, but it's, only going to, it's also going to help you reduce fraud or make more money. 
and then you, you constantly have to be making the business case for transparency, which I always find a bit, you know, like that shouldn't, it's, this should, you shouldn't be having to say, do this because you're going to make more money. You should also, this would probably be a bit more to it than that, but that's where we are. Yeah, one more Moisten issue. Um, data protection is, of course, an important issue. I mean, we should ne neglect that and see that we have, for example, a very good court ruling in Germany, federal court, um, constitutional court, saying that we have informational self-determination. Data belong to us, not to others. So it's not easy to simply argue for transparency in general or open data in general. We must also see always what the purpose of that one is. Open data, for example, for a big company who is working at the capital market, there is no data protection for our understanding because they are already open. They are at the capital market. If it's the next neighbor who is doing something like tax secrecy, for example, I would say, yes, we promote tax secrecy, not saying that this should be open to everyone. So you see, we must differentiate. Unfortunately, it's very complex, that issue, because it also gives you the question of who is in charge. <laughs> Unfortunately, Europe, for example, is not in charge for tax issues. This is a national issue. Europe is in charge for competition economic issues. So very often you find it, and this is exactly what we say, we want to may act a bit as, a, let's say, the interpreter of the system. If you look into economic and competition issues, we address Europe. When we look at tax issues, we have to address Germany as a national scale. But this is the legal background we're having. This is the situation as it is. So we have time for a final question from there. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering, uh, you just mentioned uh, taxes and Europe. Why hasn't there been more harmonization? There used to be even an office for harmonization in the internal market. They changed their name. What happened with the, the idea of harmonizing the tax system Europe-wide? Was it too federalist? Is, is this something to do with a kind of populist, um, nationalist backlash? Um, technical question. Um, I think it mostly has to do with uh, what happened last week, for example, where many of the big states, for including France and Spain, were in favor of you know, having this common ground. And it was, um, in addition to Germany, I think most of the blockers were the little states. Luxembourg, the, you know, the tax havens within the EU who are playing this role where it's not in their national interest. And since all countries have the same weight, you know, it's 27 member states and they all have the same weight. That's where a lot of the challenges are coming from in the terms of that you have some small states that really depend a lot on these kinds of like complicated structures and they are the ones who are perhaps are blocking and are not being as in favor as, um, as, as you would expect. And I'm pretty sure there's some intense lobbying also going from private sector actors uh, also, you know, so it's not just about the national interest, it's also about the private sector interests getting involved. So that would be sort of first thoughts. All right, so I would like to thank you very much for participating in this panel and uh, maybe, you know, if there's more attention also recently in the news, like you mentioned in the beginning, the case of Daphne, Caruana, Galicia at the moment, who knows, it might help to increase also the citizen participation and demonstrations and who knows where we'll go. But thank you so much for joining in the conversation today. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Yes, then I'll introduce our next part of the program. Actually, it's interesting you mentioned also the role of the whistleblowers and the importance that whistleblowers can play in this kind of work. Because with the, the next part of our program, we want to focus a bit more on a specific whistleblower, because also at the Disruption Network Lab and in the program, as Max already mentioned, we also had uh, whistleblowers participating in our events this year, and it's always been a big focus to also hear from, from the whistleblowers. Um, so we're going to watch the short film called Pink Hair Whistleblower. It's been directed by Mark Silver uh, and came out in 2018. And it focuses on the story of Christopher Wiley, the so-called data whistleblower who worked for Cambridge Analytica. And he revealed how in early 2014, there were 87 million Facebook users whose information was taken without authorization to build a system to profile and target the US voters with personalized political advertisement. So this is also an issue we went into a bit this morning in the workshop of Joanna Moll. Uh, but in this uh, short film, it's about 25 minutes. After that, we will have a break. 
Um, you'll find out more how uh, Wiley helped to engineer this architecture and how it helped to uh, perceive people as observable and measurable data sets and how this could then be used to predict and modify their behavior, which is quite a, a scary development. So um, hope you enjoy the film and then afterward we will have a, a short break. <laughs>